Um, you know, at this stage, I'll also open the floor to discussions while we continue with our discussions. But if you have a point, if you want to share anything or ask a question, just please raise your hand and ask a question right away because um, eventually we like to make it an, as interactive a session as possible. So, you know, I'll come to another aspect is, and you know, which is probably going to be Yogeshwar's favorite topic, which is e-commerce. So, uh, how do you think e-commerce has changed your role as a professional to take your mall forward? You know, what changes have you brought about in terms of uh, choosing the brand, in terms of the way you like his store to be in your mall, or in terms of just, you know, making it or bringing the mall at par with the cult of, you know, the digital world, which probably needs a lot more, lot more youth, lot more effervescence. Uh, going into the store. So what have, what is it that you've done individually within your own malls to make sure that, you know, the e-commerce does not invade your business, rather in fact it gives you a notch up and tries to create that experience which does not, ex uh, you know, it's not about just buying goods, it's about much more. So what is that much more that you're really bringing about? So I think, um, you know, we live in a world where smartphones is second nature, it's like another arm. So uh, the moment we understand that, that's the way the consumer mindset is, then you will look at e-commerce very, very differently. Uh, what we have done in, across DLF and all our malls is that our view is omni-channel retailing is here for good. Um, so I'll give you an example of how we have handled it, say in one of our formats, the hypermarket that's just opened the Big Bazaar Gen Next. It's a great new format by Mr. Biani. And uh, what we've done is we've created, in fact, that's a phase two of their project. They're gonna create something called the Endless Isle. Now, Endless Isle is you go through a few hypermarket, there are thousands of SKUs, yet maybe you're not getting your size. Maybe you're not getting that particular cheese that you want, but Big Bazaar has got phenomenal logistics. So they're creating a digital aisle called the Endless Isle just like, you know, um, say you go to a Tesco uh, and you get that with the metros there. So we've created a similar thing. In fact, we had a discussion with Mr. Biani on this and he was kind enough to explore that thought. And he's going to digitally get all products made available. A consumer can shop through that endless aisle if he or she is not getting that product. More importantly, the sales still comes back to Mall of India in the store. And I think that would be a breakthrough uh, once it is established. In the same way, uh, what we've tried to do with international brands is we've tried to tell them how to go forward in terms of more interactive experiential retailing. Uh, how do you create trial rooms which are much more e-savvy? Do you re really need to go and try all the shades? Can you go in into a situation where the trial room, one of the brands are trying that, and I hope they succeed, that is they go walk into a trial room, with one shade and you wear that trouser or uh, shirt and then you just click and then you see how you're gonna be appearing in different shades. So that's really embracing technology, but in a brick and mortar format, that's really the thought that uh, we have got because creating experiential retailing is the way forward. And uh, lastly, what we have tried to do at Mall of India very, very consciously is given space to up to 40% for food and beverage and entertainment. This is a key differentiator and another 6% for services. You can't get that through online shopping. And I do believe as a consumer, online shopping is good for value purchasing. Well, electronics, you would come and do some showrooming and go back. But there's the pleasure of actually touch and feel uh, that comes through, you know, brick and mortar shopping is going to stay. I think you know, that's, it's going to be a while before that will fade out completely. And uh, our jobs are still intact, guys. <laughs> So I do believe that, you know, 40% of F&B and entertainment is going to create that stickiness, that differentiation, and people will come back for a whole day of experience. Entertainment could be the reason they are there and they could shop. Or food and beverage could be the reason they are there, they could shop. The hypermarket could be the reason they are there for their one monthly wallet and they could shop. So really throw shopping in your face and make that much more impulse driven. That would be the thought. So uh, in the luxury space, particularly what you see happening is uh, 
most of the brands anyways already have their um, sites, uh, online sites where they are retailing through. But what they're trying to do is creating experiences for the consumer. So if you see Burberry, for example, what they do is when the international fashion show happens, they actually send out an invitation to their consumers, their customers, and they call them to the store, and they live screen the fashion show as it is happening whilst you're sipping your cocktails here. So you still feel you're a part of the London fashion show as it's happening there. You're part of the ramp show as it's happening whilst you're here in the Burberry store. And that's also impulsive because you see, you want to buy, and you go out. So that's the way they're using experiences to get in the consumers. The other thing I'd like to mention is, yes, e-commerce is here to stay, but e-commerce is, I think, being made to be a larger demon than it is right now. So uh, we Indians, as consumers, we're very social. We do not like to do things on our own. I don't think, and many of us even feel comfortable sitting in a restaurant having a cup of coffee on our own. We need company. So to that extent, that's where the mall becomes your destination. And as Pushpa rightly said, you may go for one purpose, but you end up doing a lot more. So as a destination, you're able to offer a lot more. And therefore, whether it's watching a movie, whether it's catching up with friends over a drink, whether it's lunchtime, whether it's shopping, everything is interlinked, and you end up spending your entire day there. That's how you extend it. So yes, e-commerce is here, but it's a smaller dragon than we think it is, and they're more in the valuation game right now. So the discounts that they're giving, they're not going to be able to sustain. Uh, I have a lot of respect for e-commerce because the India consumption theory, which, was, uh, which has been in discussion for the last 20 years, that there are so many people, there's so much of consumption, but it was not happening in reality. But e-commerce people came and showed that they can sell in one day a billion rupee sale. You know? There is a consumer at the right price which was not happening because maybe the quality retail was not there, quality spaces were not there, they were not getting the opportunity to buy. So if given a chance, there is a consumer who is willing to buy at the right price, maybe discounted price at the moment. But now, these are two, there are two different uh, fundamentals. For example, in, as a mall business, um, we want people to come to the mall, whereas in e-commerce, they want you to stay at home and they will deliver at home. Now, we don't know logistics at all as a mall owner. E-commerce people, the most important is logistics no so the fundamentals are different thirdly uh, the the technologies uh, brick and mortar will have i have not come across a cto in a in a, in a brick and mortar uh, business whereas e-commerce is only thriving because of technology so all these three fundamentals are different from a brick and mortar so i strongly believe in brick and mortar and i feel that malls will survive and uh, they will be flourishing but we have to be a little careful because who is stopping us to use the technology available? No, technology is available at very, very affordable price these days. Because as you know, e-commerce players, they do exactly know that who is buying, how much he has bought, last time what he bought, what is the color he likes, and how many times he has returned, how many times he has not paid after calling COD, and some, many times he has paid. So they know everything about the consumer, whereas in brick and mortar, we only know 35,000 people came. Who were they? As a mall owner, we, we really don't know much about it. I would, like, I, I would like to hate to admit this, but this is a reality. The maximum we know that somebody who walked through this is a woman and walked through this gate is a, is, is, is a, is a man. No? I mean, that's, that's the only differentiation we know as a mall, as a mall op operators. Then there are a lot of uh, um, cross... Uh, this is, uh, I have been approached uh, by virtue because I'm sitting there, so a lot of people come from abroad and they are trying to give us a lot of technologies where we exactly know what the consumer is doing, what is the consumer behavior, after buying Zara, where the lady went, and, and they, they exactly give you graphs that what is happening in your mall clearly. Secondly, once they enter the store, how is the consumer behavior, which wall is moving, which wall is not moving, what wall. At the moment, VM is, is dependent on one person's wisdom. No, let's keep footwear here and uh, store here. But with technology, you can use it where, where what is moving, what is not moving, and you can be more dynamic. There's so much of technology available at affordable price. The international players are selling it at a very high price, but Indian, uh, the young entrepreneurs, they are giving the same. They don't know what to do but they can do whatever you tell them to do. If you say that, okay, I need to know, map this behavior, they will be able to map. So I feel the brick and mortar going forward will have to uh, be more alert, they have to use technology, uh, and it's available. And you, then you will be more scientific in taking decisions, but at the moment we know, okay, this zone works better. Because when I went there, I saw a lot of people. No? That, that's the estimation, and that's how we charge higher rental. No? But when you exactly know that, okay, uh, this, this zone, how many women came, how many men came, and you know, you'll be surprised and I'm really scared to use iPhone oh, these days. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if your uh, Wi-Fi is on, 
the technology available, we will exactly know what is happening. Where did you stop for one minute? How many times you use the washroom? Where did you go? So I'm, I mean, slowly the cyber laws will catch up slowly. I don't know whether it's allowed or not, but I have seen the samples. Now we exactly know what is happening if your Wi-Fi is on without you knowing it, without you accepting any request and all that. So I believe that uh, nobody's stopping brick and mortar to use technology and start delivering home. Why not? I mean, no, there's no separate consumer who buys online and buys in city walk, no? The same consumer, when he's at home, is trying to buy something, goes to online, and when he's in the mall, he has time, he comes to the mall. So it's the same consumer. So why not when he's going online, can also think of city walk at least, you know, why can't we have you know, click and collect? And there's so many models which are evolving. Nobody knows the truth, trust me. Nobody knows the truth, what is going to happen. But malls will survive for sure, because you know, once you have bought something online, where did you wear that dress, no? Where will you go? I mean, I have bought a sari. Now I want to go somewhere. No, I come to the mall. No, so so malls malls are not shopping places. No, malls are not shopping places only. No, that's the misnomer. No, shopping happens by you know, being virtue of being there. No, and you fall in love with place. No, that's why I didn't change my job. <laughs> so I feel malls will survive uh, hugely. Uh, if the brick and mortar people know, uh, are conscious of the consumer needs. I, I think, think I'd like to add please, please. something here. I completely oh, she's agree. The ball. I really envy her and I have a lot of respect for her. <laughs> no, the, 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 the time period she is going through is the, is the toughest. You know, when you open a mall with so many wise retailers yeah. and to make them open on a particular day, <laughs> It's, uh, we have gone through, so know. we know a little bit. You know, our See, the one thing that can't collapse in our business is our vocal cords. <laughs> 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 so I think, you know, uh, I completely agree with what you're saying that in the brick and mortar space, I think where we have caught unawares, and we should admit it, is that we have not analyzed our data enough. Our data analytics have been dismal, you know, in, amongst all of us. And that is the advantage that the e-commerce players took. And they took full advantage of it because they understood that if someone uses a smartphone and say goes to a Mintra, they actually lure the person into further discounting and a, you know, same kind of, and they follow you. It's, it's the big brother attitude that they took to the nth level. And they created that base for themselves. So we have to understand where we sort of faltered. And I think, yes, we did falter in data analytics, but well, the game is so young. Yeah, I still young. remember, yeah, I've been fortunate to have been associated with all, you know, the first mall in the country, yeah, which is Ansel Plaza, right? And at that point in time, no one knew anything about the mall's business. Uh, I remember interesting conversations between Ananta and myself then, and uh, when she was in retail. And so the thing is, the evolution has been so short, and uh, consumers have evolved so quickly and rapidly, I think the wake-up call is listen to your consumers, listen to the evolving tastes of the consumers, and keep yourself completely ahead of the game. Then the brick-and-mortar e-commerce story will quit happening, and it'll all settle down. And worldwide, e-commerce is 11%, 12% of organized retail. So it's over here, you know, even in the organized mature markets. So in Korea, which is the largest in the world in terms of e-commerce, because everyone's busy on their smartphones, is 14%. So I think what really we have as an opportunity in the organized space is far higher. Our real problem is something else. I don't think it's e-commerce. It is the fact that it's a very complex business. And we, for us to create other malls, we have to look at the liaison, the approvals, and the government-related issues far more deeply. If the government is a little bit more, you know, uh, shall I say there's a single window clearance, then you will see malls becoming much more profitable, quicker in its churn, and uh, this business is here to stay. Great, great, I think, you know, it's, um, it's a time, you know, so it's an interesting time. Yeah, there's going to be a war, and the malls, mall owners are going to take e-commerce heads on, and, you know, let's see who wins. So I'll come to the last leg of discussion, and we'll do it very quickly in interest of time which is mixed use development. So really is it, you know, I've always wondered whether it has been the pressure that has led us to mixed use or whether it was really something that uh, we wanted to achieve. So I'll come to you first, Yogesh. Would you rather close Hilton and put some more stores out there and select? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, my knowledge is limited to only one center. So please don't take it as a uh, overall view. You know, it's only <laughs> one mall and 10 years. But I feel that uh, only destination malls and mixed use developments, these are the two things which are going to stay. 
and uh, cyber hub is a very good example no there were so many offices and then retail uh, that's food happened and some retail is happening so mixed use development is the only way because retail is a difficult business asset class it takes time to break even uh, it's a long drawn battle so uh, the hotel or convention center or uh, or uh, cinemas and entertainment luxury so all these will help uh, our offices will definitely help so mixed use development is definitely uh, is a better uh, player i mean in, in, in any sense any any sense and uh, second question uh, uh, mixed use and uh, another hilton is with the dlf next door but we don't mind replacing it <laughs> okay now we are short of space so i mean we can talk after this <laughs> but uh, yes i mean 20% of hotel is allowed as uh, as commercial so we have our hotel swelt uh, which is sitting above our uh, retail podium so we were in talks with them to convert that into retail uh, into commercial or entertainment because we are short on entertainment so i feel uh, retail is a difficult asset class that's why we're all listening and struggling and i just one positive point i have seen that uh, last 3 4 years there are very few malls uh, into in the pipeline and uh, only those who started know they carried on and know with lot of uh, strength but now suddenly there's a next wave and lot of people are trying to build malls which is a very very good sign enough mistakes have been done in the past now if we still make mistakes then um, then we are to blame i mean no <laughs> but uh, at the moment there's enough knowledge and wisdom and brands available to put together malls only thing is that you have to choose the catchment rightly and it has to balance it off so that uh, the developer is not you know excited to sell off the spaces there should be some component which can be sold like offices or hotel then retail will be easy to develop a mixed use development definitely is uh the best way forward because what happens is you have natural markets even hotels if you see earlier used to have their boutiques so you already had stores you had shopping and then there are the residents of the hotel who are going in there so you have certain natural partners you have offices you need food and beverage you have residential you will require grocery stores you will require a little bit of shopping you will require so a mixed use development is ideal however of course that's if you have the sheer scale that you're talking about but if it's otherwise it's also the vicinity that helps so like in sarket they may not have a hotel right there but there is the lf place which has the hilton in our case at the emporio and promenade we have the grand hotel which is close by so we actually leverage our synergies with them and uh, we have a deal with the grand wherein they get the customers across in their own cars drop them and pick them up because for them it's an avenue for their guests what do they do with their time and for us it's a new consumer coming in plus we have our tenants we tell them we can work out special rates for you at the hotel so it works beautifully when you have a mixed development it just adds to the whole thing it becomes a destination i think um you know the mixed use development i completely agree with what yogeshwar was saying that destination malls have a future and mixed use has a future and uh, the way this works is it works very organically actually uh in india you know urban planning is something that we aspire to do sorab does a lot of work on that but it's it's always a stretch uh an urban planning good urban planning develops in an organic fashion uh one of the best urban planning that developed very beautifully is the vasant kunj complex uh wherein you have three malls you have a hotel around and you have corporate offices which have uh grown around and it's really symbiotically partnering and uh, helping each other we believe that the same thing is happening even in mall around mall of india and i think in mixed use what you know one of the best examples i can give you is singapore singapore has very interesting mixed use developments take for example a few years back few decades back i'm sure we all have seen the suntech conference centers the suntech center is a conference center it's got retailing and it's got a hotel so it's a great example of vertical development which is done very well in a mixed use format i think in india we have to take advantage of those sort of developments wherein we have a positive space we have far so we need to sort of sometimes get vertical how do you create vertical developments interestingly in the mixed use format i think that's where india will be headed in urban pockets for us to make interesting mixed use developments we need to be more innovative so i get great uh, great point uh, made there by all the panelists um, you know so we'll kind of i'll have to even if there is q and a i'll have to cut short i have been almost shown the red 
button twice <laughs> that they're going to put me down if I don't get up. But I think uh, from what I understand from this panel and the kind of discussions that we've had over here is that eventually it boils down to what your consumer wants and how you're going to plan yourself around the consumer. It brings me back to the first point that I had made in the evening that e-commerce, the only reason why they're able to survive and do so well is because they've mapped the consumer. Mapping your consumer is extremely important and I think all of us, probably this room put together, cannot uh, tell you or repeat it enough that it's all about the consumer eventually. So thank you very much Pushpa, Vinaz, Yogeshwar for being here and actually sharing some great ideas with us. I think if you really ask me within real estate sector who's most pushed, I think it's you guys who's <laughs> most pushed by e-commerce. So thank you very much once again.